So, uh, welcome everybody. Um, I'm Robert Johansson. I'm uh, Deputy Chancellor at the University of Melbourne. So, on behalf of the University, welcome to you all tonight. Um, I'm also the Chairman of the Australia India Institute. Uh, and this is the second Satyajit Ray Memorial Lecture that we have conducted. Um, last year we had Lord Desai give this speech, uh, and tonight we're really honoured to have um, Samit Garawal uh, to speak to us. Um, the Australia India Institute is uh, part of the Melbourne University, part of Melbourne University, um, and our job is to promote engagement and understanding between Australia and India and Indians and Australians. Uh, we have a very broad remit. Um, the day before yesterday, we were launching reports on task force reports on scientific and research collaboration. Tonight, we're talking about cinema. Next week, we're talking about foreign policy and security. Uh, so we have a very broad remit. And I hope uh, any of you who don't regularly look at our website or come to our talks and our discussions, I hope you'll start to, uh, to, to read our website and, and start coming to them. Uh, and it's a great pleasure to see so many of you here tonight. Uh, Satyajit Ray was uh, one of the great filmmakers, um, one of the great filmmakers. Uh, his influence on all cinema around the world has been profound. Uh, and we were, when we were thinking about who at the Institute we should have as the sort of iconic figures that we would um, have as part of our uh, collection, uh, he was one of the ones. And as those of you who've been in Barry Street will know, uh, he's one of the busts that we have. He's one of our guardian angels um, that uh, around the entrance to the Institute in Barry Street. Um, in some ways, his, uh, uh, his work is entirely anchored in Bengal, but in other ways, he is uh, for all people, and he is timeless, and he is universal. Um, and uh, in some ways, I think that the, the breadth and the narrowness of, of what his work represents is something that at the Institute, we kind of aspire to. Um, so it's a great pleasure to see so many of you here tonight. Uh, and I'd now like to call on our director, uh, Professor Motu, who will introduce our speaker and tonight's talk. Thank you again for coming. Thank you very much, Robert. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure and a real honour to introduce one of India's cinema's true icons, a living legend, the one and only Sini Garewa. In her 40 years of engagement with Indian cinema and television, Ms. Garewal has acted, directed, produced some of the most memorable movies and documentaries of our time and hosted some of the most popular shows on television. After spending much of her childhood in England, Ms. Garewal returned to India while a teenager and acted in a number of outstanding movies including Raj Kapoor's Miranam Joker, Minal Sen, Pagatik, the Gorilla Fighter, Raj Khosla's The Vadan, and in the film adaptation of Herman Hesse's great novel Siddhartha. She also starred in the BBC docudrama Maharajas, based on the book by Charles Allen. In the early 1980s, her attention turned to writing and direction. She hosted, produced, and directed a television series for Indian television called It's a Woman's World. She also made a documentary for Channel 4 in the United Kingdom called Living Legend Raj Kapoor. This was followed by a three-part documentary on Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi titled India's Rajiv. She also wrote and directed a Hindi feature, each of them looks up and produced several television commercials for which she won the first prize from the 1988 Peters Award in Australia. Ms. Garewal has also anchored the TV show Rendezvous with Simi Garewal and India's Most Desirable. Simi Garewal has her own outstanding website, which really is a model of most other websites, which she uses to interact with her fans, 
The most unique thing about this website is that it is her own voice reading out the textual content. Ms. Karewal had a deep connection with Satyajit Ray. She acted in a 70th of Bengali film, Aranyan Din Ratri, Days and Nights in a Forest. In fact, it was during the making of the film with Ray that Ms. Karewal became inspired by his direction and considered it a turning point in her life. Ladies and gentlemen, Please join me in welcoming Ms. Samin Karewal, who will deliver the Australia India Institute's Satyajit Today Memorial Lecture in conjunction with the Indian Film Festival in Melbourne. And I recognize Lili <coughs> Omik Lange, the director and producer of that film festival. Ms. Karewal will speak on the representation of women in Indian cinema. Ms. Simi Karewal. I love the river, the bridges, the horse carriages, and uh, I find the people are so, so affectionate, so warm, so constant, unlike the weather. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I want to thank you for the welcome you've given us and for, for, for being here tonight. I'm grateful to uh, the Indian Film Festival in Melbourne and the Australia India Institute for giving uh, me this platform, giving us this platform to be able to share our views. And I hope that it will lead to a greater understanding uh, of Bollywood tonight. Um, in the centenary of our film industry, uh, I want to talk to you about the evolution of women in Hindi cinema. Though I have to say, I don't know if the word evolution is appropriate. <laughs> but I must forewarn you that I am not a film historian. I'm not a journalist. I'm not an archivist. I'm a Simi Garibald, actor, turned writer, director, producer, and then a TV talk show host. So I am in a way both a participant and an observer. And I can only take you on this journey through my eyes and my experience. <laughs> First, let me tell you um, of my antecedents. I think Mr. Much has already given you an idea. But I was brought up in London. In school, I did a lot of school plays, Shakespeare, Chekhov, lots of them. And acting was a passion for me. I wanted to turn that passion into my profession. But I knew that my ethnicity would not would limit the roles that I could get in the UK. So I came to Mumbai to be an actor. I arrived, all of 15, longing to fulfill my dream. I knew nobody in Mumbai. I couldn't speak the language, and I hadn't seen any Hindi films. I mean, what was I thinking? <laughs> but anyway, that is when I began my odyssey of watching Hindi cinema. I have to tell you honestly that some of the moving images that passed in front of me in those dark cinema halls were greatly disturbing, as was the message that was being sent to women in general and to this 15-year-old who was trying to discover her own country. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not
तुम्हारा प्यार हुआ 
generations of widows, imprisoned in houses of exile. I saw, I saw women demeaned, abused, and humiliated. I saw them as subjugated, subservient, surviving them. And I thought, even in the animal world, the female of the species is never treated like this. And I wonder, is this my India? You know, in the beginning, I was offered similar roles like this. The producer would come to me and say, oh, it's, it's a sacrificing role, as if that was the ultimate honor. <laughs> the director would sit and narrate it to me, and I listen, and I would keep asking, but why does the poor thing have to suffer so much? Must she weep all the time? Why is she always crying? And the director said to me, each tear that a woman sheds is money at the box office. <laughs> anyway, through films I learned about India. So for me, India and cinema is conjoined. I learned that India is a patriarchal society, a deep-rooted patriarchal society, and our cinema male-dominated. In all the laws pertaining to women, from child marriage, dowry, <laughs> conjugal rights, the barbaric treatment of widows, women were never consulted. The laws were simply imposed. And in cinema too, women are, are bound in a very narrow framework. And I find that whether she's an item girl, or a wife, or a girlfriend, she's been defined and designed by the male fantasy of what a woman should be like, how he would want a woman to be like. And the lyrics of the songs just propagate that fantasy. Just see the message that they're sending out. God. So I think, what about the other guy? I mean, the one who created the heaven and the earth. 
on, uh, forget about him, you know. More important, more powerful is your husband. He's the big man. So, the girl says, all things. But what if my husband is oppressive and unjust and cruel? Then what do I do? Then there is this thing, ah, I've got that covered anyway. I've already written that out for you. So just, just watch it. You just watch it, follow it. <laughs>
Anyway, I couldn't bring myself ever to do those stereotype roles that were, off, that were on offer. And I did only about 55 films in my career, which is not very much, because um, I, spent, I spent months sometime without work, just waiting for roles to come by where women would be in control of their lives, you know, at least um, not dominating, but with an identity of their own, desires of their own. And one of, one of my favorite films is Raj Kapoor's Mera Naam Chota. The story is of, of, a, of a young school teacher and her 15-year-old student is in love with her. And Raji, let me share a lot in the creativity of the character and, and, and of this portion of my film. And I remember he once said to me, tell me, uh, if, if this young boy comes to you and he gives you a clown doll, and he says to you, this is me. I'm giving myself to you. I want you to keep it. What would you say to him? I thought. And I said something so simple. And Raji kept it just like that. of Miralam Shoka, and he offered me a role that was so different. It was a transformation from Mary, whom you just saw. I was to be an Adivasi tribal girl. <laughs> he gave me my dialogues weeks in advance, and uh, my first shoot was to take place in a wine shop, a local pub, where all the tribals get together and, and drink. And the night before my first shoot, he said, come on, let's go and see the place where we're going to shoot, the real place. So we went along, and when we entered this place, I saw this, this drunk Adivasi woman. And she spotted our city folk sitting there, and she approached us. And she spoke exactly the same dialogue that I was to enact the next day. <laughs> so all I did was copy her. <laughs> Then I'm 
films like I have. Anyway, to uh, move on, then, then there was another film that I did. I'm just showing you four favorites. Um, that was Karis, a very dramatic <laughs> and a very strong and a negative role, which I was reluctant to do initially, but I'm glad I did it because the film was a huge hit and I won a lot of awards. <laughs> so have a look. I 
was a teenager, and uh, by Hermann Hesse, the book. I'm sure some of you must have read it as well. And when I was offered uh, to, uh, the, the film to play Kamla the Courtesan, who teaches Siddhartha the art of making love, I, w I was delighted to do it. Uh, today, Siddhartha is, uh, the book and the film, is part of the curriculum uh, in U.S. colleges uh, and is taken for, it's compulsory doing as well for literature and philosophy. It was photographed by Sven Niekvist, who is Ingmar Bergman's famous cinematographer. Absolutely <coughs> beautiful job. And uh, today, Siddhartha has become a cult film. Here are some scenes from the film. Did you not stand outside yesterday and greet me? Yes. I thought you saw me. Three years ago, I was Siddhartha the Brahmin's son who left his home to become a sadhu. However, that was yesterday. Today I have entered a new path that leads to your garden. I shall never lower my eyes before yours. Not even your fan can hide their beauty. Is that all you've come to tell me, young Brahman? I've come to say that you are all the things that will outlive me. That you, Kamala, will be all the beauty that will be in the shadow we leave. You will be my first love. My only love. Well, this is the first time that a sadhu has come from the woods with a desire to love me. I have never seen a sadhu talk like this before. I learned a lot today when I got rid of my beard. Look, I have oiled and combed my hair. I am already beginning to learn from you. Many young men come to me. And they all have fine clothes, fine shoes, scent in their hair, and money in their pockets. That is how young men come to me. You can't just be some beggar from the woods. Don't you understand? But how can I be rich? How can I be worldly? Oh, many people want to know about that. Tell me, what can you do? I can think. I can wait. I can fast. Nothing else? I can recite a poem for a kiss. Will you give me a kiss for a poem? Mm-hmm. job for you. Oh yes? It's with a rich merchant, Kamaswami. You are lucky, Siddhartha. One door after another is being opened to you. Tell me, how does it happen? Do you have a special charm? You will see, Kamala, that this sadhu from the forest can do things that other men can't. I have come to you to learn about love. From the first glance I knew that you would be my teacher, my guru. The wheels of gender equality moved interminably slow in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. All that changed, as far as women were concerned, were the fashions and the packaging, and maybe just a bit of attitude. Uh, the curves were replaced by 
zero-sized gym-toned bodies, and the fashions became a lot more westernized. But the substance and the strengths of a woman were still not delved into. Then, in the year 2000, came a film that took a big leap towards the evolution of women in cinema. Astitva. Astitva means existence and identity. And uh, for the first time, the patriarchal dominance was questioned in this film of both the husband and the son. It gave new meaning to the independence of a woman who has been long silenced and neglected. Please have a look.
May time make you a more broad-minded and sensitive human being. Good luck and goodbye. <laughs> everybody's hearts. She wasn't just window dressing. She was real. She was courageous and intelligent, so sensitive and strong. And she changed how people look at the heroine of Hindi films. I'm talking about Vinaya Balan's performance in Kahani. A female-oriented film that was applauded by the critics, the box office, and me. Oh, uh -huh. 
after a hundred years, our time has come. <laughs> I believe the genie is a woman, and she is out of the bottle. And I hope that she will be freed forever. Thank you so much. what the uh, male want, male, men want to see, the seductiveness, the titillation, and it, it thrills them. So we have these uh, item numbers, though I really think that it's demeaning uh, for a woman to have to dance and behave like that. Uh, but what can you do? This is part and parcel of this whole, as I said, devolution of women in, in Hindi cinema. But I believe, you know, one good news is that now if there's going to be an item num number, they're going to make the film an adults only film. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. We had uh, Sandra Sky. Where is she here? Is the audience on? She is. 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 I'm here to just assist. It was fantastic. No, well done. Thank you. In my experience, uh, even in the middle of the family, really the son of the general counsel of the in a family. So, could you speak into the mic there? Sure. Go read my text. Well, I just, in my experience, I've watched several hundred movies now. Has it been, are men simply unable to capture that? Is it a willful thing, you know, the, the power, the strength of a woman, or has it been an economic decision that that's, that won't make money? I'm just curious. And when we talk about the scope of 50, 60 years worth of film. This is a good question, and I think uh, your answer, what you said, the answer is in the question. Uh, first and foremost, I do feel that the strength and the power of a woman, if it was let loose, mm -hmm. it would threaten the male. No question about it. You've said it yourself. And second, as I said, it's a patriarchal society. Uh, uh, commercially, it doesn't make too much sense. <coughs> if there is a film, uh, also if a film is female oriented, a lot of big heroes will not work with her. So the film will just have to be a very small film. And if it clicks, like Kahani has, a runaway hit, you know, it can change. These films come and they change the pattern of things. So if the film is well made and it's a woman's film, people can start making more of them now. Yes, can you give a mic there, please? <coughs> With no offense to the feminist thoughts that everyone has, uh, just, uh, I'm just a little bit of more thought on the first question that was asked about demoralizing women. Uh, if I say that I enjoy going to pub, I just like showing a bit of my skin, being comfortable, is that demoralizing women? No, 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 you don't mind. That was a good question. Aren't we trying to again put us from one mold to another, saying, oh, we are going to protect ourselves, we are, we are, to, be, we are to be respected, we are to be put in a pedestal? Uh, no, I don't <laughs> believe that a woman should be put <laughs> on a pedestal. You're missing the point. Would you like to answer the question? Why would you? Let's have uh, a You have to look at the social consequences. Why don't you take the mic? Yeah, sure. You have to look at the social consequences of what is portrayed in the cinema. Most often, these item numbers have little connectivity with the story. 
They are put in there for titillation purposes, right? And you know what's happening in Delhi? That is a direct result of what is shown in our movies for purely titillation purposes. At the end of the day, India is two societies. There is the pre-modern man in the post-modern world, and there is the modern man in the post-modern world. Mm -hmm. It's the pre-modern man which gets titillated and seeks a release of, of uh, for the want of a better word, around him. But I think from what you're saying, I think, you know, there is a, in our industry now, and correct me if I'm wrong, there is a very thin line between when a woman is being objectified in an item number and when she <coughs> is celebrating her sexuality, you know? So I think what you're saying, going to the pub, <coughs> being yourself, that is being comfortable in your skin, which we all support. Yeah. And we all want Absolutely. To uh, More power to, to yes. you. Yeah. But you know, some, but some of the songs like, um, I can't think of an example. Are you Chameli? Yeah, are you Chameli? And titillating and so on. Yeah. But the line is very thin. Yeah. You know? Good luck. Maybe to the woman in the black. You should be white. Um, Thanks. Why don't you just wait for the mic, please? First of all, thank you so much for the wonderful talk you've given. Uh, together with the clips. It was so interesting. I think I'll go back and watch most of those movies. Um, following the Delhi rape case, Bollywood film industry was bombarded throughout the world in every newspaper as the cause of what happened. A bit ridiculous. However, I can also see why. You being a producer, director, writer of the film industry, one of them, um, and I think uh, very prominent um, Indian filmmakers and actors like uh, Amitabh Ji and Shah Rukh Khan and all these people have also said the same thing. Do you think there is going to be any difference in the style of filmmaking in India from henceforth? In other words, no more subservient women, no more, you know, um, lengthy rape scenes and, um, and titillizing, uh, uh, you know, scenes from movies. I think rape scenes are absolutely out from now on. No actor will perform it, no female actor will perform it. Because this, what has happened in Delhi has had such a huge impact on everybody, emotionally, on our psyches. The word rape terrifies us now whenever we talk about it. But I don't even know if you people know, I mean, you're talking about the rape of Nirbhaya, which happened in December, just before I came here, it was a tragic rape of a five-year-old child, a five-year-old girl. And I want to tell you all that when we arrested the man, he said that he had been watching porn on his mobile. And that is what got him all charged up. And then he went out and he found the most vulnerable creature that he could find, which is a five-year-old little girl, and he proceeded to mutilate her. So what I'm trying to say, this has got nothing to do with Bollywood. Mm -hmm. And the rapes that we did have earlier on during the times of Ranjit and all, <coughs> all that has petered out now. Mm -hmm. Actually, you have a, when did you last see a rape on a, mm -hmm. in a film? Mm -hmm. This is how it was, as I said, you know, and during the 70s, the 80s, 90s. Mm -hmm. But now people are aware of that you will not see any, any further rapes. And whether you will see women uh, more empowered, I don't know, it all depends on the commercial angle of cinema, I wish they would be, because you know, I think our Indian <coughs> women are so brave and so fantastic that I feel they deserve that, that uh, glory on, on the screen. Mm -hmm. very talented. Oh, absolutely mm -hmm. talented and beautiful mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. kind and, <laughs> and, 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 and compassionate. Absolutely. Um, Firstly, thank you, Simiji, for such an insightful presentation. And I have to say, I've absolutely loved your rendezvous talk shows and your India's Most Desirable. They've, um, it's, it's so amazing what you get out of um, actors and really go down deep. But I um, wanted to know if you could go back in time to your 15-year-old self, what advice would you give to yourself? 
first learn Hindi before you come to India. <laughs> Watch films, get to know a little bit, do your research. I do tremendous research in my talk show, TV talk show, you have no idea. I wish I'd done that at the age of 15 before I came out to India. But uh, you see, as I said to you in my talk, for me it was, it was a whole discovery. It was a discovery of Bollywood, a discovery of my country, which I knew so little about. And uh, it was happening, you know, at the same time, so it was all quite, uh, it was bewildering for me, and it was quite traumatic for me to uh, make that change over from an English school, a very simple, typically English school girl, coming out here and being thrown into this, uh, uh, what should I call it, you know, where the women were, it was, you know, horrific what was happening to our, to our Indian women. I couldn't believe it. For years I've been like, not accepting that this can really be allowed, and why is it being allowed? It shouldn't be allowed. We should raise our voices, we should, we should do something. But none of us do, we've become apathetic, which is very sad. Very apathetic about politics, we're apathetic about what goes on in the government, we're apathetic about our conditions. Yes. sitting because my legs are <laughs> shivering. <laughs> I'm a little nervous talking to you. But, yes, no. um, uh, I think my question was more about your what you said, um, that movies were made by men for men. But do you think slightly there could be a role of women propagating that message as well? Because these women were accepting the roles, the derogatory roles. Um, were there no Simis at the time? Were there no uh, women who believed that they could bring the change? I and mean, why did it take a hundred years for, for this uh, turnaround to happen? And even then, not completely turnaround, but we've got the first few steps, the baby steps have, have, have been taken place. Uh, you know, I'll tell you what, even today, uh, a lot of our girls are wonderful actors. I think Priyanka Chopra is a very good actor, Deepika is very good as well. Um, these girls don't always get terrific roles, but they are still part of the cinema industry. And to remain a part of the cinema industry, they have to accept what they can get. Even if they're, ha if they're in, in a hit film, which is a male-oriented film, a hero-dominated film, it helps them in their career to get more work. Otherwise what? Leave Bollywood and do what? Better to stay here within the system and go along with it until maybe a great role comes. <laughs> Would you agree that it does portray a little bit of what is happening in our Indian and Pakistani society, that women are um, victimizing other women as well? I don't Doesn't that happen? No, I don't think women are victimizing other women. You know, people keep asking, is society a reflection of films or is films a reflection of society? Our Indian society is over 8,000 years old. Films are only 100 years old. So we, uh, but the unfortunate part is the films are going back centuries in the way they depict women, which they shouldn't do. I, I really, really believe what I told you earlier. We could have changed it. Bollywood could have changed it by the sheer example. Imagine a Salman Khan uh, treating his girl with, with gentleness, <coughs> with affection. <laughs> you know, treating her with respect instead of being chalu and all that kind of stuff. Other guys would have seen it and said, Hey, Salman, I say, <laughs> That's what I'm trying to say. We never did that. That you don't have to stalk a girl to win her over. And I really believe that women don't like macho men. They like men who are gentle and, and, and kind and understanding. Men like macho men. <laughs> a two-way street in terms of it would be good if Bollywood from what's happening in society can be the catalyst for that change adopt a moral code there should be I mean there's money on offer to do an item number there's someone to accept that money one side has to stop it takes two to tango so someone's got to make the decision and say look I might have to pass on this film but at least I know I've done the right thing morally but it's it's a far short 
can't the see woman, that happening. The woman won't pass on the film because there are too few films for her to do. <laughs> she will do it because she needs it or it will help her on in the future. But she was so right. You know, somebody has to take that call. Yeah. But it's, uh, a, it's, it's too a tough call. But it's too competitive. Yeah. You know, it's just we, everybody's ready to cut the other one's throat. Mm -hmm. So nobody's going so to give it up and be. Nobody's going to be so altruistic and say, oh, you know, I'm giving it up for a bigger cause. Nobody will do that. And that's a sad reality. It's very sad, but I, I think these item numbers will also start going down now. Now when they get an Earth like certificate, how many kids will see it? It will affect the box office. Mm -hmm. Just one more point. Films are meant to be a medium of entertainment. You can have entertainment through laughs, you can have entertainment through music. It doesn't have to be through itemizing women. You know, I absolutely agree with you, but that itemizing is not for you. Yeah. <laughs> You're not supposed to enjoy it at all. But you know, I'll tell you something, I'll be very honest and frank with you. I can still tolerate that item woman. I'll tell you why. At least she's in control of herself. She's seductive as much as she wants to be. She's in control of her life, she's in control of the men. What I can't tolerate is the subservient woman. To me, that is a bigger crime, that a woman has to be subservient. Hi, Simi. Uh, Simi, my question to you is, you've been a TV host as well, and you have been connected to movies as well. Uh, do you see a pattern of regressing between uh, you know, Bollywood and TV, where we have uh, Bollywood movies like Kahani, and then we have TV uh, operas like soap operas like uh, Sazbi Kabhi Bahuzi. Do you see we take five steps forward and three steps back? I mean, do you see that pattern? How do we sort of balance it out when we have uh, a serious like you know, Sazbi Kabhi and we have uh, and Balika Badu and yeah. all those. Yeah. I agree with you. No, because I think films, uh, television at the moment in India is what <coughs> cinema was in the 70s and 80s. It's very old-fashioned. I mean, a lot of this stuff that I told you about, this Arti Nikhedi and all that stuff, it's, it's all on television these days. Or oh, everything is full of, ye vivaj hai, ye custom hai. Nothing but ceremonies and customs and superstitions. It shouldn't be allowed, but who's going to stop it? There is, I mean, a little notice comes, if you object to this pro program, please write to so 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 I think we only have time to go. I think we can be here all night. Um, we've got one more. Uh, yes, please. Yes. Thanks very much. Um, it was fascinating hearing you talk. Um, do you think there's a religious underpinning to the attitude um, towards men in the worship of male gods? Female gods. No, male gods. <laughs> <from women. laughs> Do you think they're that's the reason why there's... Gods. Yeah, sorry, male gods, so like Krishna and Vishnu. Do you think uh, the attitude of women towards men in Indian society is due to the, um, the worship of male... or there's an underpinning of the worship of male gods? Um, worship of male gods. I'm not yes. clear, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, I'm not too clear about this, if you don't mind. No, no, okay, so um, you're, what you've been talking about in your talk yes. is the subservience um, in the past uh, that women have shown to men. Yes. That's great, isn't it? So um, do you think that that has been a reflection of um, the religious devotion or the religious observance of, uh, or worship of male gods by, um, by women. Actually, you know, I'll tell you, uh, actually in India, there, there are far more female, uh, there are goddesses that, that people worship. Uh, there are male gods, but uh, even the females worship the female gods, the goddesses. Uh, you know, the Lak Lakshmi and so, so many others, I can't do now, everybody. Um, I don't know, uh, I don't think that has too much bearing on uh, people's attitudes. This is pure chauvinism, actually, what, what we're talking about, you know, where they want control over the woman. And the best way to keep control over the woman is 
through their power and uh, through these laws that they have passed. I don't think the religious angle is, um, is, has any significance, really. I, that's what I feel. I may be wrong. <laughs> Gentleman, he's been running an awfully long time. Are we going to add that? We might have to be there too. Okay. We've got two more, everybody, and then we'll have to wrap it up. Thank you. Thank you, Sumi. That that was really a powerful um, presentation, particularly for the first time. I was really charged. The first time I've done something like this, you know. I was very nervous. <laughs> um, the question that kept going through my mind, even through the Q and A session as well, was. There's this assumption that um, Indian cinema is working through this matrix of what some may call compulsory heterosexuality, and I'm wondering if you could speak about, free, uh, well, speak about, say, same sex, in particular, same sex female representations in Indian cinema, and um, same sex, same sex um, uh, representations of women in Indian cinema, same sex sexuality, such as. Uh, deeper methods, fire, and I'm just wondering whether that may be seen as almost the point where patriarchy is almost inverted. Um, I'm just wondering if you have anything you could comment on or say something about. It. No, I mean I know what you're saying. There are two films that have come to mind: one is Deeper Methods, Fire, and I think also in Madhu Bhadrakar's Heroin, they show that slightly. I don't know uh, if it is. Uh, uh, a battle against the patriarchy system. I think it's more of a last resort. <laughs> I mean, you know, this is a better way after something. I don't know. But um, it seems so. I don't know. I can't understand, understand that too much. I haven't studied it too much as to why it happens. Uh, I don't know why. Can you understand? Anybody know why it happens? <laughs> It's probably the last resort. I mean, who can put up with that guy who's been beating the daylights out of me? Better go with a gentle woman. <laughs> this guy is good. I think we have time for one more. I don't want to disappoint anybody, I so I do. Uh, if anybody wants to, I think we should be on chance. Yes, please. Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hi, Simi. My name is Sunila. Um, I'm a big Hindi film junkie. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I've seen most of your movies, and um, I actually come from Fiji. I've been here too long though, but as you know, Fiji is a, is is very well known in India. Mm -hmm. It's like a little India. Um, you just mentioned 100 years. It took 100 years for for, for you know Hindi cinema to recognize women. Um, it's evident that you haven't been acting for a long time. So uh, would you would you be interested in going back to acting and and doing films to actually recognize women, I mean, like you, as you say, and you've been waiting to get roles in, in doing films to... No, I'm not interested in acting uh, in a film. What, what I'm planning to do very soon uh, is direct another film, and I've written, a, That's I've written a script, and I can't wait to direct it. I keep dreaming about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> also, I'm coming back with Rendezvous. With Sydney Garibald, so that will be coming back in January, and I hope you'll watch it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> yes. Sydney, this is a, sort of a connected question, but we talked about women um, in front of the screen, in front of the camera. The cast is only one part of the filmmaking process. So, one of my biggest uh, complaints, if you may call it, is there's been the odd Usha Khanna in the music directing field, there's been the odd, you know, Zoya Akta, there's been yourself, there's been line producers like Neetu, but there hasn't been enough. So my question to you is, why has that happened, firstly, over, over many years? And in the future, if there were more women at the helm of things, like, say, taking directorship like yourself, um, or even the production departments, would there be different content coming out in the films, do you think? Would there be different content if there were more women directors? I don't think so. I'll tell you why. Because if a woman uh, has to direct a film, the film still has to be commercial. Because if that film flops, she's never going to get enough money to make her next film. So she will have to fall in with the commercial scheme of things. So don't, I don't think, I mean, she will try and put in her female angle into it. And, you know, the, 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 that part will be there. But commercially, it will have to work. And the past, you know, why, I mean, has there been a... Has there been 
you know, uh, resistance against film makers being female, or has it just been? No, I don't think a lot of women have come up who um, who want to. You know, it's very hard work to direct a film. It's a lot of big slog. So a lot of women are, aren't really that interested. Uh, they're not technically inclined towards directing films. I feel that because I talk to a lot of them, and I talk to a lot of the girls who are actors, and I say, don't you want to direct? Because, I mean, the real creative control is in direction. Acting is just one dimension. Don't you want to grow? And uh, they say, no, we want to do that. You know? <laughs> 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 have to be an actor. Yes. Oh, yeah, they're there. Yeah, please, he's been waiting. Okay. Could you give a mic back? Because... They're also, yeah, sure. <laughs> Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It's really a pleasure to be talking to you. Um, I think a lot of the discussions today and, oh, and a lot of the debate today has been over how women have been objectified in Indian cinema and how there's been a pressure on them to go, as you said, from uh, curves into, you know, into a size zero body. But I think one, there's one key aspect that hasn't been given its fair due of attention and, uh, yeah. and I guess, yeah, attention today, which is that of the, the male. Um, we've seen that, you know, that Indian movies are made around the male, their desires, etc. But if you look at the man, the male hero, say in the 1970s, he had a pot belly. If you look at the male hero today, Rithik Roshan, John Abraham, they have six packs, and in many movies, they're exposing more skin than, than the female is. <laughs> 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 um, so, you know, I have many female friends, my peers, they'll go, you know, they'll be like, oh, so nice out, John Abraham, you see him in his trunks like this, and you know, things like that. So they're going to see John Abraham, I'm going to see Priyanka Chopra. We both obviously have some sort of object, objective, you know, thing in mind. I think mean, that's fair and square. She's going to see John Abraham. Um, you know, she has the pressure to fit into this size zero body now. Priyanka Chopra going to swimsuit, run down the beach. Now I have pressure. Oh, well, I really like that samosa over there, but am I going to look like John Abraham? No, I'm not. So I'm going to go, all right, give me my egg whites. I'm going to go to gym, work out. It also puts a lot of pressure on the young, young male as well. Um, so what I think, an important point that I guess hasn't been given its, I guess, fair sense of attention in today's discussion is that, yes, there has been a lot of, of pressure on the female, and, you know, those pictures that we saw before were really powerful, and, you know, they're by no means correct, but on the other side, we have to look at, hang on, you know, things can't just be one-sided, you know, we have men in modern cinema who have all these pressure on them, pressures on them now, and, a young modern man myself, and I have to go and keep myself <laughs> down. I feel like I'm living here. I'm going to be a necessity of being, you know, out running the rat race. So um, that was just the point I wanted to raise um, out of today's talk. You know, uh, that requires uh, the next talk should be the evolution of men. Then you'll cover all this. Thank you very much. That lady, I promised her, or she did. Lovely lady in the blue. I think that does have to be. She was so generous, she'd be doing it. No, I won't put that tomorrow. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you, Linda. I love you too. That's why I'm here. <laughs> you will get your turn as well. That lady's getting her turn now. Hi, Cindy. Hi. So my question is, cinema journalists are still need to, you know, learn a lot because they never portray Indian artists, you know, the way they should, you know, write or talk about Indian women artists in cinema. To what extent do you agree with this? Oh, I totally agree with you. <laughs> I think, again, you know, it's all a question of commerce. What sells? If you read it, that means it sells. So that's why they give you more of that stuff. But in any case, we never believe a word we read about or read in the papers. Most of my actor friends, they just don't even get all the magazines at home. And that's the best way. You know, what you don't know doesn't hurt you. <laughs> yes? Mic there, please. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to... See everything and question and answer session. No, 
Uh, what I want to say is that uh, don't you agree that men should get up and uh, uh, control themselves and there should be a way in the whole country, our whole nation, our whole world that they, they should think before what they do and they should not wait for any movies or anything. Are, they, are we waiting to learn from there and then stop <laughs> all this nonsense, what is going on? So it is, I think, we, we need something else uh, which should encourage everyone or think before what they do. There should be some other way is needed. I don't know whether one movie can, how many people will be able to watch that movie and they are affected. I think it is uh, something else is needed. Believe me, what is happening in Delhi and what's happening in India and in other places, there's only one way to stop it. That is to put the fear of God in those people. But in our country, we don't punish anybody. They're all free. But this is it. But this is not in our hands. This, this ha the policies are there. The laws are passed in Parliament, but there's nobody to execute it or implement it. And I can't believe it can go on and on, year after year. It takes 15 years for a court case, 14 years for court cases. The situations change, people change. I mean, look at Sanjay Dutt. How long ago was his court case? Now he's being sentenced. It, it, and not only that, there is no fear of rape. They always feel they could get away. I would, I mean, I would say have a public hanging uh -huh. so that everybody can watch and everybody can say. A politician, a politician. I said, why can't you have a public hanging and put fear into everybody? He said, oh no, no, we are a democracy. I said, a democracy, so people are free to rape, but you can't, you're not free to punish them. But this is how they think. It's, it's tragic. I'm sorry? What about the education system? Isn't that supposed to teach you how to rape? Absolutely, and the people who have been doing all those rapes are people who are living in the slums. They're not educated. And education is coming to India, though, let me tell you that. The government is really fine as far as education is concerned. It will take time. Look at our population. It's such a vast population. It's not easy to do this overnight. But there are a lot of free schools. There's a lot of internet training going on in the villages. And it's quite remarkable how quickly these little village children pick it all up and know how to use the internet. Oh, okay. yes. In Pushka, my internet in Pushka, I've been in <laughs> yes, is that amazing? Yes. So it will happen slowly, but as the first, I want to punish. I want to see one person punished. I don't want the news to be given to me, oh, he was hanged last night. I want to see him be hanged. <laughs> and the worst part is, you know that Viraya piece? I must tell you this piece, because you're all, you know, you will understand what I'm saying. The main mastermind behind the Nirbhaya case was that 17-year-old boy who is going to be 18 in June, on June the 4th. But he will not be punished. His, he will only get three years in a remand home because he's not yet 18. He was the mastermind behind everything, behind the whole way. Everybody knows that. Now, the law has been passed that 18 is the age for a death sentence for rape. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry to use this language, but the fact is science has proven that a uh, male is at a sexual peak at the age of 17 and a woman at the age of 37. So at the age of 17, when a male is at a sexual peak, he is roaming around free and if he does commit any rape, all he's going to do is get three years in a remando and then he can start all over again. Out. <laughs> Hi, Sami. It was really nice to meet you here. Thank you. I want to ask a question. Uh, is there any effect of Indian uh, Hindi cinemas on female fetus killing, which is right, uh, right now happening in India? Do you think there is effect of Indian cinema? I don't think so. You know, somebody tweeted uh, a line which I thought was, he said, woman, you are in danger inside the womb and outside. And a 
it was so true. That's what it is. Female infanticide, <coughs> killing the fetus just because it's a girl. We are so far behind. We have such a long way to go. But we'll get there. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.